When you fell into that depression, how dark was it? When you're waking up and you don't want to live anymore. You know, it's hard for me to say sat here because I'm not thinking in that mindset anymore. Mm -hmm. But there was a number of years where I did not want to live on a daily basis. I said to God, why have you let me wake up this morning? Why didn't I die in my sleep? And I had no real reason. There wasn't one thing that made this happen. This is a continuous journey for years and years and years. The chilling story of Edwin Valero. Nine rounds had gone by in Monterey, Mexico, and Antonio DeMarco's trainer had seen more than enough, withdrawing his man from the bout, saving the challenger from further punishment, writing DeMarco's name on a growing roster of victims felled by Edwin Valero, making the second defense of his WBC 135-pound title. Valero had added the 27th name to his burgeoning record. All 27 had failed to hear the final bell. The 28-year-old Venezuelan was no ordinary champion. Having boxed only 66 rounds in eight years as a pro, his 100% KO ratio was only part of this man's incredible story. When DeMarco was finally pulled out on that evening in early February 2010, Valero's career at the top level was truly ready to launch. What fans and pundits did not know at the time is that they would never see this wildly unpredictable two-weight champion in the ring again. Welcome to a primal boxing presentation. This is the chilling story of Edwin Valero boxing at its most primal. Just two months after Valero had battered DeMarco, he was involved in a manic 48 hours that stunned the boxing world. Jennifer Carolina Vieiro de Valero, the 24-year-old wife of Edwin and the mother of his two young children, was brutally stabbed to death in a hotel in the Venezuelan city of Valencia. Hours after the incident had taken place, Valero walked down to the hotel reception to confess to stunned members of the staff that he had killed his wife. Police were called and he was arrested and taken into custody. The body of his wife in a hotel where the couple was staying. Police say Valero left the hotel room at about dawn Sunday and allegedly told security he had killed the woman. Struggling with mental demons and substance abuse problems, Valero had been detained for previously mistreating his wife just weeks before the fatal assault. 24 hours after his confession, the lightweight belt holder would also be dead. How did you respond when you heard that he killed himself? Well, you know, at first I don't believe that he, he'll do that for himself. I called his manager, uh, uh, who happened to be Jose Castillo. I asked him and verified him to him, and then he said, yeah, he did it. But, you know, according to him, he didn't do it. They killed him. Valero always led a troubled existence, in and out of the ring. Stories of feuds, bizarre anonymous shootings, and increasing paranoia followed the heavy-handed southpaw throughout his final years, as he descended into a crazed world of drug and alcohol dependency. And one time, and then, and then he said that, oh, I have a good friend now, I can't go to, I can't go to uh, the Philippines anymore because I have a good friend. But I knew the fact that, you know, those good friends that he was staying is the, the, the friends that he has over in Venezuela that giving him some drugs. Even his first attempt to turn professional in 2001 was put on hold. Despite closing in on 100 amateur contests, Valero looked to cross codes with a Venezuelan promoter before a motorcycle accident put his best laid plans on hold for a year. He later explained to American media that his motorbike had hit another vehicle at high speed and Valero, wearing no helmet, was left with a fractured skull. After finally convincing doctors that he was capable of embarking on a career as a prize fighter, Edwin wasted little time adapting to his new profession by smashing away 18 consecutive opponents in the first round. Midway through the streak, Valero had piqued the interest of Golden Boy Promotions, owned by former multi-weight world champion Oscar De La Hoya. This link-up earned Valero some valuable time in the States, and prominent journalists like Doug Fisher began taking an interest in his story. Trabajo para que para ganarme la afición americana, mexicana. 
Valero's intense sparring sessions, often with well-known names of the time, started emerging from the gyms and are now the stuff of legend. But as quickly as Valero's career progressed, problems were always lurking around the corner. In the middle of his knockout run, with a prime slot on HBO secured on a New York show, the South American failed a pre-fight medical based on the injuries he had sustained in his motorcycle accident. A doctor from the stringent New York State Athletic Commission suggested that he should never fight again given the underlying extent of the damage. Despite these dire medical predictions, such as the Wild West nature of boxing that Edwin managed to find locations willing to sanction him, Argentina, Japan, Panama, France, and Mexico all kept him in business. The one problem that persisted across the world was that his handlers were finding it hard to bring in opponents capable of lasting any considerable distance. One opponent who lasted longer than most was WBA super featherweight king Vincente Mosquera, who dropped Valero before being eventually stopped in the 10th round in his home city. Most importantly, globetrotting Valero had finally become a world champion. Four defenses followed, three in Japan and one in Mexico all against substandard opposition, none of whom came close to lasting the 12-round course. In April 2009, Valero finally found an American state willing to license him. Headlining in Texas, the Merida native dominated Antonio Pitalua in three rounds to take home the vacant WBC crown and cement his name as a two-weight world champion. During this time, Valero hooked up with veteran U.S. promoter Bob Arum on a three-fight deal. Is, 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 Valero, is Valero next? Is that the biggest money out there? No, I think not. I think that Valero needs another marquee fight, a marquee fight, before it would be worthwhile for Pacquiao to fight him. And that's why I say fight Marquez. And the winner of that fight would be huge against Pacquiao. Aram also promoted Manny Pacquiao and was lining Valero up for a crack at the Filipino superstar. Aram later declared that it would have been a tremendous spectacle. Given the prowess of both men, it would be hard to suggest otherwise. The career trajectories of Valero and Pacquiao could hardly have been more apparent than on May 2nd, 2009. While Manny Pacquiao was busy destroying Ricky Hatton, on the same night in the same state, Edwin Valero was being busted for drunk driving. That incident led to visa issues that prevented Valero from appearing on a Pacquiao undercard later in the year. Around this time, Valero called out both Pacquiao and Hatton, while the UK's Amir Khan made it known that he would favor a Valero fight. Edwin was becoming a fighter worth talking about. <laughs> Meanwhile, Valero's behavior outside the ring descended into chaos. In September 2009, Valero was arrested in Venezuela for allegedly attacking his mother and sister. In early 2010, his badly bruised wife, suffering from a collapsed lung, told police that she had fallen down the stairs as Edwin was once again arrested amidst claims of domestic violence. Wherever this troubled individual went, problems were sure to follow. Which leads us to April 18, 2010, and the bedraggled figure of Edwin Valero waking from a drug and alcohol-induced haze, confessing to the murder of his wife. Bizarrely, Valero would retract his statement soon after, replacing it with a fantastical tale of kidnap, underworld crime, and attempts on his life from criminal elements. He said that he had been chased and was hiding out at the hotel on police advice. 
to further muddy the waters, Valero's wife had reportedly been admitted to a hospital a year earlier after being targeted outside the family home by unknown assailants who shot her in the leg before exiting the scene. A day after his confession, Valero was found dead in his holding cell. He had used his trousers to hang himself, a photograph of his family clenched between his teeth. The weapon used was never recovered. Conspiracy theories surround the death of Valero. Some say the authorities wanted him dead, that it was not suicide. Others believed that this inherently violent, paranoid man was indeed being pursued by dark, underworld forces. One thing is for sure, violence and trouble followed the Venezuelan wherever he roamed, and a tragic ending was sadly inevitable. The most prominent three victims are his wife and two children. Edwin. He really was a complete fighter, and I think the closest we came to seeing everything was in his last fight against Antonio Camargo. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the classic story of the Matador versus the Bull. The night Edwin Valero defeated Antonio DeMarco live on U.S. broadcaster Showtime should have been the start of a glorious career at boxing's highest level. He suffered a bad cut. He had to go on the defensive and still throw his bombs. Uh, that was quite a performance. It was probably as good as we saw him. Instead, it was the end of a roller coaster ride that well and truly fell off the rails. Don't forget that vital combination of like, subscribe, and ring the final bell.